everyone. Welcome to another episode of Debatable with your host, Sina and Kyle. I'm Kyle. And I'm Nina Tomas. And for today, Kyle Ortega and I are joined by AJ Orate and Nat Armada. And the three of them are classmates in human rights theory and practice in UP Law. And they're our guests for today as we discuss, well, you guessed it based on the title, Human Rights. So hello and welcome to our podcast, Nat and AJ. I guess we can start off by having some introductions. Um, so Kyle and I will begin. So I'm Nina. I'm your host. I graduated political science in UP, and one of my advocacies is the right to health, spe- specifically mental health. Um, I'm Kyle. You guys already know me because I, I'm constantly talking about my studies on this podcast. But um, my actual like advocacy is the right to a healthy environment because I've been ranting about that ever since. I was a kid, like third grade, I was giving my teachers copies of The Inconvenient Truth and then getting mad at them for not teaching it in class, stuff like that. So that's something I really care about. Hello, everyone. My name is Nat. Um, I'm also from UP Law. Uh, I was born and raised in Iloilo, and I'm still here now because of the pandemic. And personally, my advocacies uh, are women's rights and environmental law. Hi, so good afternoon. I'm AJ. So I'm also from UP Law. I'm currently a senior. Uh, So I think what I would say are my uh, personal advocacies would be uh, children's rights and also the rights of indigenous people. I think it's very important to not overlook the sectors of the community since one, as a child, developmentally, it's very important to have uh, the uh, opportunities and everything for you to be a realized human being one day and also the indigenous peoples because I do think they're discriminated against and they're overlooked so they need more uh, representation uh, from various uh, sectors such as especially from uh, the legal profession. So thank you again Nat and AJ for your advocacies. Uh, Kyle and I are very happy to have you on our podcast. So for today, we're going to talk about human rights. And the concept of human rights is something that I I hope most people are familiar with. But sadly, not a lot are knowledgeable about. So our goal for this episode and for today is to shed important light on issues surrounding human rights, as well as answer questions one might have about the topic and delve deeper into issues surrounding human rights, not just locally, but internationally as well. To start it off, I guess the fundamental question that one would have to ask, whether you are new to the topic of human rights, whether you're a law student, whether you're a debater, is what are human rights really, and how would one describe them or characterize them? Yeah, so human rights, I, I feel like everyone has this idea of what human rights are. Like, I have them because I'm human, stuff like that. Um, But a lot of the time, or at least the way that I was taught is, if you have a human right, it's just something that you deserve. But that's only one half of it, right? It's not just something that you deserve. It is also something that you're entitled to, that you can ask someone um to give you or to respect. Uh, So it's actually an entitlement. So you're entitled to have those rights protected by your government or or by your state simply because you are human. So as a human, you have the ability not just to feel happiness or sadness or pain, for example, but you also have a concept of self. Like you, you understand that there is a distinct concept that is you that no one else has. So as a result, you also have this concept of dignity. So human rights is basically what entitlements do uh, you have and what responsibilities do states have to ensure or protect so that those people, including you yourself, can have that dignity. And this is important because even recently, right, um, in the Jessica Soho interviews, Ping Laxon was asked by Jessica Soho, about his views on what Duterte said. When Duterte said back in 2016 or 17, your concern is human rights, mine is human lives. Ping was asked, um, human rights or human life? Ano mas matimbang? Which is more important? Ping said there should be a balance, but we should also understand that human rights includes human lives. That's kind of correct, right? Um, that human life is included in human rights, but I don't think that that's a proper way to approach it. Because you're approaching it like you're that you're approaching it like it's two different things, but really they're they're part of the same whole. 
um, actually human rights is what makes human life worth living. So you might be alive, but under undignified circumstances, and that's not a life worth living. And so you can't treat human life and human rights as two separate concepts. Lagi and magkasama, human rights makes us human. Where do these concepts come from? Like, how does one just decide that human life is valuable? And how did we end up conceptualizing these things to become the laws and the, the way we treat individuals that we see today? Uh, well, there are different theories. No? Uh, one is based on natural law. And under natural law, we are born rational creatures. We have brains. We have this concept of dignity. Um, but the fact that we do have those things, the fact that we have this capacity for rational thought, people are thinking that we were designed naturally Um, to strive towards that concept of dignity. We were meant to strive towards that dignity. We were meant to use our thoughts and live the way that we wish. That is inherent in us as human beings. That is the way that nature designed us. Uh, so that's one. And that's actually like the most prevailing one. And you can even see it in, uh, relig- in religious um, philosophy. But another theory is that human rights don't really exist. They were just invented by consensus. Like a bunch of people just got together and said, yeah, this is a right. Um, so that's the reason why Jeremy Bentham, who we talked about before in this podcast when we discussed utilitarianism, Bentham said, there's no such thing as human rights. It's just nonsense that we raised, we elevated by giving them stilts or high platform shoes or something like that. So There are some theories that sort of mix those two views. For example, one theory says uh, human rights are inherent, but we discover and recognize them along the way. So we've always had those rights. It's just very recently in our history that we've come to recognize them as inherent. Another theory is that uh, we've always had some basic rights, but new rights are formed. And as the world changes, we decide collectively that these new rights exist. So a possible example of this is the right to internet. Um, it's still up to debate, up for debate, whether the internet is just a place where human rights should be protected. Uh, so like, is it in, is internet access an extension of already recognized rights? Or is there a distinct new and separate right to internet access as a whole? Yeah, so uh, adding to those different theories. So those are the three main theories, um, rational thinking, religious beliefs, and social consensus. So for some people, The concept of human rights started from irrational thinking as human beings. So we take that from the logic of since we're all here, we're all human, we want to give and get good things in return. So you can see this in the golden rule, which is treating others how you want to be treated. And most of the time, it's interrelated with what some find this concept in religious beliefs passed down over time, because you can see Uh, Christian beliefs in the golden rule also. So in fact, the U.S. Declaration of Independence in the text, it says that our rights, that everyone is created equal, these are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So these rights were given us, given to us from God. So, uh, and for others, it's social consensus. And Uh, that means that in order for society to keep going in just not in in a way that's just not organized, but also in an orderly fashion, we in order to achieve the lives that we want to live, the ideal lives that we want, uh, we have to follow certain obligations and give people the rights they're, they're, they are entitled to. So we see this in the uh, the passing of the Magna Carta in England back in 1215. So what happened back then was that King John violated a bunch of ancient laws and some landed lords had enough of that since they were being screwed over. And they basically forced him to sign this document, which said that the government had the obligation to protect the people. And this document enumerated what is what we know today as human rights. So of course, these texts weren't the first to say what, what our human rights are because they even excluded women, people of color, and other members of other religions. So, however, these texts are important because uh, they were what's, uh, they set out eventually what is the UDHR. And even these concepts go as far back as the Code of Hammurabi, the Quran, and the Bible, and even the writings of Confucius. So uh, even Native Americans use the codes of conduct and justice from the Incas and Aztecs. So as you can see, even though The term human rights or the concept human rights was coined 
uh, fairly recently, back in the 1970s, uh, we could see that this concept dates back hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's interesting that it seems to have an evolution of sorts, right? So human rights is not something that just came out of nowhere, as you've both enumerated. And I did hear a mention of the UDHR. And this is a term that gets thrown around a lot, not just within the debate community, but anyone that you ask about human rights. So I want to ask and clarify, what exactly is the UDHR? Um, Is it enforced? Is it even enforceable? Like, what are the issues surrounding that that make it such a hot topic, regardless of you know, when the concept of human rights are talked about or where it's being talked about. So the UDHR or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's sort of, you know, it's in the name. Like it's it's a declaration made by a bunch of these like countries, most countries that went like, okay, we recognize that there are some basic human rights that we have to protect. But really the declaration did not really say, okay, you're supposed to do this and we're going to do something to punish you if you don't do that. Um, But also, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not a treaty. So there is a difference between like a declaration and a treaty. Because a treaty is something when states agree to limit their freedoms, their sovereignty, so to speak, in order to um, enter into treaties so that they also get some sort of benefit from it. Meanwhile, a declaration doesn't have that kind of force. It's just saying, yeah, we're it's a declaration. We're saying this, but we're not really obligating ourselves to do anything yet. So because of that, many debaters say that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights isn't enforceable because it's not a treaty. That's only partly true, though, I think. It's true in the sense that it isn't a treaty, but it isn't necessarily unenforceable just because of that. So first of all, some parts of it are considered um, part of customary international law. That is to say, um, okay, what is customary international law? It's a source of international law that isn't in treaties, but are still considered to be binding because of longstanding state practice and a general belief that it's just something that we should do. So for example, there isn't any treaty that says we have to respect each nation's sovereignty, right? But we respect each other's sovereignty because we have done it for as long as states have been existing. And we did it because we were of the opinion that it was something that we're obligated to do. So that's one. Another thing is it can be considered soft law. So soft law is something that's not binding, but you can use it as ammunition to sort of pressure the government into doing certain things by saying this is what the world expects from all countries, including ours, we should follow suit. So this is like the World Health Organization or the WHO when it recommends a lot of things as well. It's not binding on us, but it's strategic for us to follow the recommendations and it also improves our reputation. But yes, it's not a treaty. It's not a treaty, which is why the international community did actually end up creating binding treaties um, that are based on the declaration, the UDHR. Um, The most important ones are the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that's ICCPR, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, ICESCR. There are others. So for example, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, those kinds of things. Um, So there are a lot of them. Those are considered binding. Many of these treaties establish bodies also that serve to help enforce compliance with these treaties. So you can go to the Human Rights Council, you can go to the ECOSOC or the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, stuff like that. You can file a complaint, but they call it a communication. It's basically a complaint to these bodies. And they sometimes issue decisions that tell states, hey, you have obligations under this treaty. Uh, get it together, fulfill your obligations. Uh, So these are international bodies that give avenues for a remedy in cases where certain countries do not do their obligations, they don't fulfill their obligations, or they don't have a remedy set in place under their domestic law. So for me, an important aspect when considering this question, we have to look at the history of how the UDHR was eventually put into place. So Eleanor Roosevelt, you might know her, she's pretty cool. So she took on the lead as the chairperson of the drafting committee of the UDHR. Even she admitted that the provisions of the UDHR are not legally binding, but that the declaration was powerful enough to make the peoples of all nations understand that these were their rights. 
she said that their rights carry no way unless people know them and unless they know them, they won't be able to demand them. So UDHR, as Kyle said, was the starting point of the other UN charters and treaties and spurred basically the development of international human rights law. And uh, on the part of enforcement, uh, the duty to actually enforce human rights is with the governments of these nations themselves primarily, and they are tasked to protect and promote human rights. And when the actions of the government are not enough, then as Cal discussed, there are there are international courts and tribunals that you can turn to when human rights violations are committed. I guess the next question I have still about the UDHR would be why couldn't it have been made binding on its own? So what is stopping countries from universally agreeing through a treaty that human rights should be enforced in particular ways? Well, part of the problem of the UDHR is that, uh, and there there is merit to this criticism, is that it's somewhat ethnocentric. So if you look at the countries that oppose the UDHR when it was first drafted and trying to be passed, that countries like Afghanistan, uh, Turkey, Egypt, these are mostly countries that are not from the West or in some way Western influence. So What the document failed to account for are the cultural norms and values that exist in other parts of the world. So when we look back at the drafting of this document, 58 countries were involved in its drafting, but mostly in order for the drafters to come to a consensus, the main actors, which were the UN Committee on Human Rights and the UNESCO Committee on the Theoretical Basis of Human Rights, excluded some of these values in order to come to a common ground. So for critics, for cultural relativists, they would say that we should leave it up to the countries to determine how human rights are implemented and measured. And there shouldn't be just one model of human rights. But to me, this would lead us to an impasse. Do we accept that in some countries, young girls can't go to school because that's the tradition in that country? Do we just accept that in some countries, the right to life isn't absolute? Again, we go back to the drafting of the UDHR and we see that there was close to 200 draft resolutions and there were almost 100 meetings to consider these drafts. So the drafters really did spend time and effort to consider all backgrounds. And for me, there has to be a balance. The UDHR is important, of course, in setting out the rights we have. It's important that we say, we declare that we are all equal and that you can't discriminate me. You can't discriminate anyone based on their gender, based on their religion, what their skin color is. But the text of the the declaration and, of course, the different um, instruments, they have to be contextualized and localized based on the different uh, nations. Okay, so um, just to build on the discussion already, in the creation of the UDHR, there are a lot of representatives of various states. Um, there was still the question that um, since there are a lot of states and there are a lot of groups within those states, and there are countries which have um, tribes, uncontacted peoples that were not adequately represented, people were asking, um, uh, is the UDHR really going to be respecting their traditions and their cultures? Since um, for those in the West or those who are westernized or abide by uh, modern policies and laws, they can look at their own uh, existing uh, structures, their laws, and they say, uh, oh, okay, I'm compliant with the UDHR because it's very simple. Uh, I I give uh, opportunities for education, I, pr- I protect my constituents, and everything like that. But then um, if you look at uh, some countries, they have um, certain tribes or groups of people who abide by a different set of rules uh, which are internal and very personal to them. So if we're going to look at their traditions and then look at the UDHR, people are going to say, oh, but they uh, have this uh, They have this rule that if the, this person does a wrong, he or she is punished this way. And it's not really compliant with the uh, UDHR or the ICCPR when it comes to um, uh, uh, imposing sanctions on certain uh, infractions of uh, members of the society. So that's the conclusion there is that um, universality is different from uniformity. So as the UDHR and human rights, they are being universal, 
it um, it respects the diversity across cultures and across states. Because um, uh, universal doesn't mean uniform. So if it's uniform, that's where there's going to be a problem that, oh, this is very strict. Ito lang ang kailangan natin sundin. So I don't think there's really... Uh, Uh, a problem here if we just respect the fact that human rights are supposed to be universal and states are given a leeway on how they can make it more specific and how they can um provide a higher uh i think guidelines or laws on how to implement and respect uh human rights uh within their uh sovereignty their territory i like how there's a mention of different groups and different bodies that have like come up because of the establishment of the UDHR and how those are used to actually pressure different bodies in different countries to comply with human rights obligations. So I kind of want to ask how effective those things are because while they're established and while we are aware of their existence, there are certain countries that seem to get away with human rights violations. So I guess like if we look no further than China. How are they able to get away with all of these violations when we have already established bodies that are meant to investigate and prevent these things from happening in the first place? Actually, first first of all, you don't need to go as far as China, no? Because you you can actually start here in the Philippines where there is an international human rights body that was like, hey, Philippines, stop, fix it. Um, But we didn't actually do it. So there are some decisions by human rights tribunals that aren't being implemented by the Philippines. Um, the example that really stuck out to me was Hernandez versus Philippines, um, which is a case that was um, brought to uh, the HRC about the killing of Benjeline Hernandez. Uh, she was a student journalist from Ateneo de Davao. She was killed by state forces, paramilitary groups in 2002. Um, it was an extrajudicial killing. Um, so in 2006, the mother, Evangeline Hernandez, filed a communication with the Human Rights Committee, the HRC. So the communication was basically saying, why is nothing happening with the case? Um, Because usually you need to be able to exhaust domestic remedies first before you bring it up to an international human rights body. Um, So a lot of the time, if something is already happening um, domestically, it can be used to render that complaint or that communication inadmissible in that human international human rights body. Okay, so in this case, actually, that was the contention. The government was saying, we are actually doing something. Um, there is an ongoing case. We are trying to fix our rules. At the time, they were uh, discussing um, the rules on the writ of Amparo, uh, which was released in the following year, 2007. Uh, so yeah. So when Evangeline brought up the, the complaint, she was saying, why is nothing happening with my case? I have a right, we have a right to an adequate remedy under the ICCPR, the ICSER, uh, stuff like that. And the next year, 2007, the committee said the Philippines has to start ensuring that, number one, the people responsible are prosecuted um, and you know the, the case is um, resolved. And number two, to give reparations um, to the victims and the victim's family. So it could compensate siya for the loss that was incurred. And number three, report back to the committee within 180 days saying what were the steps that we took in order to um in order to fulfill these obligations or to like to implement these recommendations. So the question now is what happened there? What happened with Hernandez versus Philippines? Number one, the court acquitted the main suspect of the crime. Actually, that person, I forget their name, but that person was actually promoted within the military. Number two, um, with regard to paying them compensation, paying them reparation, the problem was for a very, very long time, the government hasn't complied with any of them. Um, So there isn't any news about actual reparations being made. The last report that we found was from 2013, I think, which mentioned that there wasn't any reparations being given, even compensation. Um, so it looks like Jung report, it doesn't really work. So to answer the question, it's difficult because international human rights law doesn't really have police. It's not imposed by an authority, unlike domestic law. Uh, so so legal philosophy terms, we say that it's not positivist. Positivist law is something that's imposed by a, a superior authority or a higher authority, like the government. So it's not positivist. Yeah. 
Uh, so positivists would say because of that reason, international law, including international human rights law, isn't real, quote unquote, real law. But we can still use these decisions to pressure our government to actually comply. So that's actually what I think we should start doing. Like, let's pressure them to start complying. Let's um, get other people involved and start pressuring erring states to start complying as well. The view that I take personally is that international law actually does tend to be followed more often than not. It's just, you know, um, we tend to focus on the times when it's not being followed, but most of the time it is being followed. Um, the reason for this is a reputational element. There's a reputational element in international law where, you know, you keep doing human rights violations, you keep violating your treaty obligations, people will be less likely to make deals with you. People will be less likely to enter into treaties with your country. And as for China, um, its reputation for violating human rights, especially the rights of Uyghur, uh, of Uyghurs, uh, it's catching up to them. It's catching up to them. It has done a lot of abuses. So um, a lot of countries, particularly in the EU and other places in the West, have already imposed sanctions on China. Um, and a lot of Asian countries are more hesitant to start engaging with China. So a lot of countries, uh, for example, India, they're like, I know that you have something called the Belt and Road Initiative, and we don't want, we're hesitant to be a part of that because you do have a bad reputation for like imposing unfair conditions. You, you stole like very important ports from Sri Lanka, stuff like that. So your reputation follows you and it will catch up to you eventually, I think. Okay, so um, uh, from my point of view, uh, the issue is more on the matter of interpretation and implementation, especially by the governing bodies within the state. So I, I do believe that um, the existence of the UDHR does put pressure for compliance, but the application is more of a case-to-case basis approach, considering that... um. The circumstances which gave rise to the question of the uh, of human rights issues is different. So, for example, here in the Philippines, there was a debate about uh, human rights in relation to the drug war. So, the government here is saying that everybody has the right to a healthy environment, a healthy society, and the existence of illegal drugs and the proliferation of its use and uh, the growing business behind it uh, is working against. Um, public health and safety. So they were saying that oh, okay, uh, EJKs are I, um, uh, the illegal raids and detention and the subsequent EJKs are warranted. However, um, this takes attention away from the fact that the victims of this drug war, like those who are merely accused or alleged uh, pushers or users of drugs, uh, they are they also have human rights which are uh, being violated. So. Like under the ICCPR, they should have been afforded uh, uh, proper legal measures to address uh, and to raise their side that, oh, okay, I was accused, I was uh, allegedly, I was a pusher or a user, but, you know, they should have been given the opportunity in the proper court or a proper proceeding to defend themselves. So every year, they're just saying that, oh, nanlaban and everything. So that's okay. It's okay that um it ended in death. It ended um in arbitrary detention. So uh so that's the problem for me. That's what I see as the problem is that um well there is pressure. It's about how we take that pressure, how states take that pressure and um implement it, uh interpret it, and then subsequently apply it uh to their own uh circumstances. Yes, it's actually pretty disheartening if not appalling that China which is not only a signatory to the UDHR but actually played a pretty big role an important role in its drafting repeatedly violates it and it even violates its own constitution which you can clearly see just how much they value human rights so just picking up from what Kyle and AJ said it's it's definitely a reputation thing so that uh while China may be quote unquote getting away with their actions now since they're a big player in the international community. I do think, however, that the world is watching. So, uh, for example, you can see it in the issues in the West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea, how the US and the UK and Japan backed up our claims and how some US corporations have moved their businesses from China to Indonesia and Malaysia. So, you know, there may be hope. Um, recently in the 
UN General Assembly 43 countries condemned the Chinese government's actions towards the Uyghurs and everything that's happening in Xinjiang. So I think it's also important to remember that it's the Chinese government that sucks and most Chinese people, they're, pre they're pleasant and they're also uh, victims of what's happening with the Chinese government. So I think all of you mentioned that when violations take place, there are often remedies for it. I guess my mistake here for skipping this question, how do we even know if violations have occurred? Like, how do we measure if they are being protected? How do we measure if things are faltering? How do we as individuals and as the law look at these things and predict that something's going wrong? So in international law, in these treaties and these charters, there is what we call co core entitlements. So these are legal and reasonable expectations that an individual or a group of people have. These are their expectations that they are to be treated a certain way based on this specific charter or this specific treaty. So you take these core entitlements and you see if the level of state obligation, which is if they are being respected, protected, or, fulf or fulfilled, you look at if uh, these, are, these are coinciding. So what the state obligations mean is that, is this state respecting, meaning are they refraining from interfering with the enjoyment of human rights of the individual? Is this state protecting, meaning are they preventing actors or third parties from actually violating human rights? Or, and are these states fulfilling these core entitlements? Are they taking positive measures? Are they adopting appropriate legislation? Is there policies and programs in place so that human rights are realized and ensured? And the way to know this is that there are rights monitoring bodies like non-governmental organizations such as the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. They monitor whether states are uh, fulfilling their obligations to the treaties that they have signed. And there are also treaty monitoring bodies or committees for each um, international human rights treaty. So for example, if you remember just a few years ago, Vera Files came out with a report on the drug war that's happening in the Philippines. So that's an example of that. Yeah, so actually there are more specific core entitlements depending on what right you're talking about. So there is that obligation always to respect, protect, and fulfill. But for many human rights, the UN actually gives comments and makes articles saying, for a certain human right, you should expect X, Y, Z um, core entitlements. You're entitled to this, this, and this, um, so on and so forth. So for example, the right to food, which is actually a big deal right now, because it was recently affirmed in a resolution in the UN General Assembly last December, um, and it blew up just recently because it was released a few days ago. Um, so a lot of people were very shocked that, for example, the United States didn't vote towards recognizing that there is a human right to food. But the human right to food has been around for a very, very long time. And you already saw a lot of people going, uh, a lot of um, pronouncements from the UN saying that if we're talking about the right to food, we're also talking about the core entitlements of availability, of adequacy, of accessibility. Um, so availability would be, um, is it physically available to you? Adequacy is, is it enough for your basic needs, for your nutritional um, needs? Accessibility is economic accessibility. Can you actually afford it? Uh, so those are the core entitlements of the right to food. So Actually, the framework that you can use here is, let's say you're looking at a certain law that affects a certain human right. You can make a table. Like the top row, you put your core entitlements. The first row, you say respect, protect, fulfill. You fill up the table then. Does the law respect, um, respect this core entitlement? Does it protect this core entitlement? Does it fulfill this core entitlement? So on and so forth. And you can, you, actually, you can actually make a lot of commentaries about a lot of pending bills about it. And that was one of the things that we did for our human rights theory and practice class. We were looking at a lot of bills that we felt could be improved upon more from a human rights perspective by using that framework as well. Um, so there are also the factors of uh, the essence of human rights. So we have to consider 
these essences. So the first one is that human rights are inalienable. By definition, human rights can't be taken away under any circumstances. So it can be qualified by any characteristic of an individual such as sex, status, or race. And then the second one is that um, human rights are indivisible, interrelated, and interdependent. So all human rights coexist for a holistic and complete experience of human life. And these rights are connected to each other. And by the experience of one, another human right is realized. So it's like a chain reaction. So there is no right that is deemed more important than the rest. And then the last one is that human rights are universal. Human rights are applied equally to any and all persons, regardless of their uh, aforementioned characteristics earlier. So um, by looking at these factors and applying them to the question regarding a specific right, if these are present, then more or less at the basic level, there is a level of protection uh, being given to uh, certain human rights. So you mentioned that they are universal and you also mentioned that no right is more important than the rest. I guess the next question I have then is, are human rights always going to be absolute? Um, Not always. Not always absolute. Um. But I have to clarify what you mean when we say absolute first. Because when we say rights are not absolute, there are at least two ideas of what this means. Like when, when they say this, human rights aren't absolute. When they mean uh, What they mean by absolute is one of two things. Either A, it can never be suspended, even during times of war or calamity or public health emergency or a pandemic. Or B, what they mean is it's absolute, meaning it can never be limited. For our purposes, those two are different things. Um, if the right can be suspended, um, it's more proper to say that they're derogable rights. Derogable. You, like you can derogate from your obligation to protect, respect, fulfill these rights. For example, your right to travel, that can be suspended during a time of emergency, including a public health emergency, or during war. Which is why, you know... We're meeting on Zoom and not in real life because our right to travel, our right to move around, our mobility has been, or it could have actually been suspended, but right now it's just being limited, you know? So actually your free right to travel, that can be derogated from. There are non-derogable rights that may never be suspended even during a time of war, even during a time of emergency. For example, the right to life. You can never ever suspend that. You will always have the right to life no matter what. Um, the right to be recognized as a person under the law, that's another one. Freedom of thought and religion, that's another non-derogable right. You can check. Um, the ICCPR has a list of all the non-derogable rights. Um, on the other hand, if rights cannot be limited, as in you can't regulate how it's exercised, that's what we call absolute. Um, so there's a difference between absolute rights and, der- and non-derogable rights. Um, some some non-derogable rights are absolute also. For example, whether there's a war or not, you have the absolute right not to be tortured. You have the absolute right not to be enslaved. But on the other hand, there are also some non-derogable rights that can be limited. So non-derogable rights that are not uh, that are not absolute as well. So freedom of religion, as we've talked about in this podcast before, you can never suspend it. Even during a war, perhaps especially during a war, people have the right to find their God. But you can limit the freedom in the sense that you do not have an unlimited um, ability to act based on your religion. So the freedom of religion can never be suspended, but the exercise of that freedom can be limited. Uh, For a more controversial example, right to life. It can never be suspended, but it can be limited because in some instances, the state may impose the death penalty. Um, Whether it should impose the death penalty is debatable. Because some people say that it's per se cruel and inhuman punishment. Some people say it's flawed and an irreversible punishment that you can get wrong. Uh, Ping Lakson would like you to watch a Netflix movie about it. Um, But if it's about the death penalty, I just want to clarify that the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights allows death penalty. But it allows a death penalty only for the worst of the worst crimes. So personally, even though our Supreme Court said that our death penalty is constitutional, it's kind of weird that we have the death penalty for mere possession of drugs. But if you kill someone, that's homicide, for example, that does not give you the death penalty. It gives you reclusion temporal, which is up to 20 years. So you can actually see, like, what are the priorities that we have as a society? Like, we care more about possession than actual, like, killing of people here. So I feel like it's 
kind of telling, but it's also quite debatable as well. Mm, so um, the classification of rights as absolute or not and derogable or not is important because while the UDHR is not binding, these categories provide a bare minimum guide on how human rights are treated. So, for example, um, these rights are embodied in our constitution and an in-depth discussion in class showed us that uh, there are tests that can be applied for rights which are derogable and can uh, can be limited. So, for example, freedom of speech and expression. So, based on the list, uh, freedom of speech and expression is non-derogable, but it's not absolute. So it can be limited. Uh, in jurisprudence here in the Philippines, uh, spe- particularly uh, Chavez v. Gonzalez, three tests were discussed, uh, namely the dangerous tendency test, the balancing of interest test, and the clear and present danger. So uh, the last one is the one being used uh, here in the country now. So seeing as speech and expression can be perceived uh, differently, just because one person assails a certain form of speech or expression as obscene or libelous, does it mean automatically it's considered as such and can be subject to um, indiscriminate uh, limitation or even censorship. So we can also see this uh, in the context of uh, election campaigns. Uh, the means and methods of uh, expression used in campaigning can also be limited for uh, purposes of fairness and uh, equality. So I guess this next question is sort of related. In instances where two rights conflict or compete with each other, how do you gauge which one is more urgent or more important to protect at that particular point in time? Well, I think this is a pretty interesting question because most of the colorful cases and the uh, big human rights issues, they uh, they stem from this competing human rights. So, and in our daily lives, I think we've encountered this phenomenon since uh, I think for the first time, most people uh, encountered this during the COVID-19 pandemic. So for example, the right to health, which is to not get sick either for ourselves and for others, clashed basically with our freedom of movement, which we saw in the many lockdown measures all over the world. So there are different ways to gauge which rights need to be prioritized. So we first take a look at whether these rights are absolute or not, as uh, Kyle discussed just a few moments ago. So we look at whether these rights are absolute or not and if they can be suspended. So if they can be suspended, whether these rights are derogable or not derogable. So remember that there is no hierarchy when it comes to rights. So not one right is necessarily heavier or no one right is necessarily more weightier than the other. So we also consider whether the competing rights may be reconciled. So we ask if there is a middle ground or can we find a compromise? So if not, then the next best solution should be considered. Yeah, so like what Nat said, there is no hierarchy, right? So if it's in the international human rights law sphere, that's the idea. There's no hierarchy. Everything is co-equal. All rights are indivisible, but many can be subject to limitations as may be set by the law of a country. So in the Philippines, ideally, deciding which one is more urgent to protect isn't really a matter of law. Like, like th- there's a law that says which is more important. Um, it's a matter of legislation uh, and the democratic process. So if you find that the law, and a lot of times the law is just not on your side, um, and I think we can talk about some examples of this later, but sometimes the law is just not on your side. That's a time when we have to realize that we can't just look towards lawyers um, to solve these problems because it is a matter of legislation. Uh, and that's a time that we have to uh, start organizing to fight for our rights. And that, that's actually the reason why we have the right to organize and, and associate and ask for redress from the government. It's because sometimes they get it wrong. Um, and that means it's our responsibility to try and correct that by convincing our representatives to fix the problem. Uh, that's how we got to decide, for example, that in labor cases, doubts should be resolved in favor of labor. You know, so if there's a conflict between the employer and the employee and the law isn't clear, then we should err on the side of the employee. OK, so that's how we got there. Like, obviously, our labor laws, they're not perfect, but um, it's because of efforts of organized groups that we got a lot of these strides. And that's actually the reason why we're very like... We're very compliant with the International Labor Organization. 
Um, so in one case, uh, the Philippine Blooming Mills Employees Organization versus Philippine Blooming Mills, in that case, the workers went on a strike against um, the abuses of the Pasig police. And the workers were fired because they went to that strike. So the employer, Philippine Blooming Mills, was saying the strike deprived them of some profit, which is a property right. But like you have the right to profit from your property. But the court said that between the right to property and freedom of speech, we resolve it in favor of speech because that is a fundamental right. So you can see that there's a difference in the way that international human rights law views human rights and the way that we view it here in the Philippines. Uh, domestically, we do have a hierarchy, even though in hu- international human rights law, there isn't any hierarchy. Would you say, therefore, that in most instances or in a lot of instances, it's a case-to-case assessment or are there general standards that can be used in these instances? Wouldn't it be also prone to abuse if someone gets to decide which is more valuable than the other when conflicts arise? Because in the case you mentioned, um, it, it seemed to be that the court just decided what was fundamental. Wouldn't this be a problem if the courts couldn't be trusted in certain instances? Um, so I I do think that the general standard here is, again, the concept of the derogable and non-derogable rights and the absolute and non-absolute rights. But I also do agree that it can be subject to abuse because as I discussed earlier, there's a problem between uh, about the interpretation uh, and implementation of these uh, explanations uh, of how human rights are supposed to be uh, respected and implemented and how they um, apply on a case-to-case basis. So similar to another thing I said earlier, like in the drug war, there are two rights which are uh, being weighed. Actually, I don't think they even weighed it because they didn't really, the government didn't really consider the rights of those they are accused are accusing of uh, being involved in the drug trade. Uh, but uh, so it's an issue here that um, like similar uh, in genocide, the intent based on my research, the intent uh, is difficult to determine. But in times of war, it can be to establish and gain control over a territory. So the right to life here, among others, is uh, of the targeted group is violated for the sake of some uh, political agenda. So one side will argue for its necessity and in these cases, as we can see, when that side that is arguing is the state or the government, abuse over individuals or a group of individuals is more than likely. It's, it's like a power struggle. So uh, if there is a more powerful side arguing for the uh, that this certain right is more important or should be uh, given priority in a certain circumstance, uh, they had to talaga the other side, which is most likely uh, individuals or discriminated groups of individuals. So besides that, are there any other current lapses in human rights law that are being taken advantage of Now, for some reason isn't being addressed or is just really hard to tackle and deal with? Yes. Uh, so actually, marame, marame. So one of them is the right to housing, the right to housing. Um, because right now, with respect to the house of uh, the right to housing, there is a core entitlement, which is security of tenure, that you can't just be deprived of your housing now all of a sudden. But in our law, there is something called an ejectment proceeding um, or an illegal detainer proceeding or um, yeah, so those kinds of proceedings. The deck is kind of stacked against the poor because... Um, in a lot of cases, right, like you enter into a contract where you can possess a certain property for a certain amount of time. Um, and let's say that the contract expires. When the contract expires, the person who actually owns the land um, can choose not to renew that contract. And because the contract has expired, it can just kick you out. Like they can file a, a suit against you in court saying that you are holding or you're possessing this uh, property illegally and you should be basically evicted from it. You, you can be kicked out of it. Um, and it's very difficult to uh, fight that back, to fight back. Um, and also in a lot of cases, like very poor people, they don't even have those contracts that are written. Um, so the court views these cases as um, the owner of the property was only letting you stay there through mere tolerance. Now, mere tolerance is the phrase that the court uses and if it's just through mere tolerance 
they can kick you whenever they want. Um, when they stop tolerating you, they have the right to kick you off the property. So um, there are some loopholes with respect to the security of tenure. Um, there is a special rule when it comes to squatters because under the Lina law, um, if you have squatters, there are, in, in many cases, you also have the responsibility to relocate them. But there's still a loophole there. Like at first glance, you go like, mm, that's nice. You have to relocate squatters. You have to make sure that they have a place to stay. Um, but in practice, there is a loophole there. Um, and one of my professors talked to us about this before, where there's a practice where if you have like a squatter community, um, an informal settler community, you can soak a cat or some small animal in gasoline and set them on fire and make them run around the, the community, burning, burning it down so that they are forced to move away. So there are still some loopholes there. Um, and I wasn't even aware that that loophole existed until my professor talked to me about it in first year. Um, you can also argue that other things, uh, for example, freedom of speech, um, criminalizing defamation is something that you can say is unreasonably restrictive uh, because in our jurisdiction, even if you say something that is true, if it is considered um, defamatory, you can still be um, imprisoned because of that. Uh, you can argue that's an unreasonable restriction of freedom of speech. It can also be uh, arbitrary stuff. So for example, possession of drugs, the penalty of it is life imprisonment to death. Um, right now, we suspended the death penalty. So usually the penalty that's imposed is not death, but life imprisonment. But life imprisonment is not defined in any law. So the judge just makes up a time on the spot, like, hmm, life imprisonment, I decide that's 10 years long. Like that. Or life imprisonment, I decide that's 250 years long. It can be very lucky or very unlucky, depending on the judge. So it really allows arbitrariness. You can argue that it's cruel and it's unusual. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been challenged yet and hasn't been amended yet. Um, but yeah, there are many loopholes, actually, that are being taken advantage of right now. Uh, another right is, uh, for me, the right to employment to a certain extent. So um, there are still several, uh, several instances of labor violations that go unchecked because employers take advantage of uh, certain loopholes or they just take advantage of their employees in general. They have this idea that uh, if the employees don't really report these labor violations, then what's the harm? You know, like, uh, these employees, they needed to live, they're breadwinners of their family. So they just deal with this um, labor violation. Sometimes they don't even know that it's labor violations. They just think, uh, okay, maybe this is what I deserve for my um, skill level, for this kind of uh, job. This is, this is normal. This is okay. So they don't really have the opportunity to assail their conditions because they're not uh, they're not aware of what should be the standard based on law, like under the labor code. So they, they also don't get uh, benefits. Some of them don't get benefits. And we, we saw during the pandemic that um, there are certain uh, industries which did not afford uh, their uh, employees any assistance, especially those that can uh, work from home, like construction and everything. They weren't given assistance by their employers. They weren't given any uh, leeway or opportunity to take their leave and to still get um sal uh, salary for it or you know any kind of um reaching out to them. They don't. They, they weren't given that. And then there's also um the right to education. So under the ICESER, it said there um that the right to education, especially uh primary education, should be free. For all, so uh, so beyond that, um, there is really little to no opportunity for the poor to actually avail of um, further education. And even in cases where in education is free, like in public schools, um, the facilities are not best suited to actually provide quality education for this uh, for for children. And since um, human rights are interrelated and interdependent, if um, these people are not able to avail of um, the right quality of education. They also can't get uh, the right quality of um, employment opportunity. So they don't get the opportunity to improve uh, their quality of life because of the, these circumstances. 
Um, and the next one I think would be um rights of uh, indigenous people because um despite there being laws in place like the IPRA, um it's easy to take advantage of it because there are misconceptions of the, about the members of the IP community as not modernized and it's easier to manipulate and deceive them into not uh, asserting that they have a right uh, that is uh, special to them as indigenous peoples, like the right to their um, ancestral land. So there are, uh, there are groups who advocate for them and seek legal assistance on their behalf because they are really overlooked. But um, uh, this is more of a, a remedy approach so from the beginning while there are laws it's not there's not really a movement or a conscious effort from the government to uh, consciously okay we need to uh, strengthen these laws the implementation of these laws yung hindi na kailangan that there should be a problem that would arise for them to actually pay attention to the indigenous peoples community so um uh, as, as uh, based on my research as recent as 2020 this is on an international level uh, there are protests being held by indigenous peoples to against state actions which endanger their environment and their lives so like in Brazil the Kayapo indigenous peoples group they blocked a road in protest um of the creation of a railroad so because um the creation of the same is was done uh, it was approved without the consultation with the IP community so this is I I've, I've seen this a lot happening that um their rights that oh okay that's their ancestral land that's where they live they have the right to property they have the right to uh, enjoy their you know their traditions their environment and everything pero pag may problem na that's only when people actually pay attention and it's usually uh, it usually takes uh, these uh, indigenous peoples uh, a lot of effort to actually get their point across, to get their voice to be heard. So I think that's really uh, an example that's of a human right that's being taken advantage of. Yes, I definitely agree with AJ. Indigenous peoples' rights are definitely uh, issues that aren't being addressed. And we can see this even if we don't look at what's happening in the world. We can see what's happening even in the digital sphere with what's happening. Uh, with our generation, like sometimes I feel you can see this gap when the indigenous people's lives or their culture are being trivialized. So I'm not saying that everyone who does this, but there are definitely some people who, for example, get tattoos from Apo Wang Ot, but then they don't even bother to learn about the culture. They just do it for clout and for Instagram likes, and they actually don't care about the uh, culture of the Kalinga tribe. So I think that you can uh, see that as uh, an illustration of how the gap between how we uh, perceive Indigenous people's rights and what's actually happening, that there's definitely a gap there. Uh, and then I think one of another issue, another right rather, that's uh, not specifically addressed is mental health. So for example, in the uh, Convention on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, Article 12 speci specifically states that uh, everyone has the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of both physical and the mental health. But often, uh, mental health isn't a part of the conversation, even when we were looking at the policies, the governmental measures on the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns. They were mostly concerned with physical health. And uh, of course, it was important to have um, people stay in their homes, but we didn't consider the mental health aspect of isolating yourself from the community. Maybe we didn't have um, friends or family that we lived with, what, what do we do then? Mental health wasn't uh, considered. So I think uh, mental health should be also recognized as a human right uh, alongside and uh, of equal importance with physical health. I kind of want to go back to the discussion on Indigenous people because that seems to be one of the more overlooked issues that exist, not just locally, but internationally as well. And I guess a question a lot of people have, including myself, would be, are Indigenous peoples' rights distinct from human rights? Because it seems to be that they are treated differently, um, even if, you know, objectively, they might be the same. So why are they not adequately protected? And what are your thoughts on whether the distinction should exist or not exist? 
Well, first of all, they are human rights for sure. I think that they are human rights. Um, again, meron tayong covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, the ESCR. One of the most important human rights there is the right to self-determination. And actually, most of our uh, instruments or documents, most of them recognize the right to self-determination. And it makes sense, right? Because the only reason why you were able to make a government or a state in the first place was because you exercised your right to self-determination. So self-evident yet. Um, so by the right to self-determination, we mean uh, it's a process by and the ability by which people can determine their political status, choose their own identities, stuff like that. That is by freely pursuing their own development on the social, economic, and cultural level. Um, indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. In fact, we have the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples made by the UN and in consultation with many indigenous um, groups. Kasama sa declaration na yan, yung right to maintain and strengthen um, their distinct political, legal, and cultural institutions while retaining their rights to participate fully if they want in the political, economic, and social, and cultural life of the state of the territory in which they belong. So what's important there is that they have the ability to choose. So the first one there is, yeah, they have the ability to choose. And the second one is they have the right to maintain their distinct institutions. Um, so while in some cases, that does mean they're exempt from certain rules or they have different rules compared to everyone else, the basis for that is they were there before anybody else. Indigenous sila. Eh. So they were there before anyone else. They were there before the state was created. Um, before the state as we know it was even existing. So for example, land. Uh, the general rule is that all lands belong to the state um, because of something called the Regalian Doctrine. I'm not sure if we talked about this on the podcast before, but there is something called the Regalian Doctrine. And under that doctrine, um, basically all the lands belong, if not to the king, to the government or the state. So in order to have a right to own a certain land, you have to show that the state gave you that right or your predecessors in interest were given that right. So if you possess a property for decades, but it's not declared by the government to be alienable and disposable land, you can't have it registered in your name. Or if you have, for example, uh, I don't know if you have access to a title to a property, a uh, torrent title, you can check it, um, and you have the ability to see that there, there is a line where it gets passed down from one person to another. And at some point, you can trace it back all the way to a positive act of the government to give that property or the right to own that property to a private person. Um, but for indigenous peoples uh, here in the Philippines, we recognize that there's something called a native title. A native title is saying that your right to the land isn't something that's given to you by the government. It isn't given to you by the state. It was given because you were there from the very beginning. You were exercising your right even way before the state existed or since time immemorial. And that's actually the basis for um, the IPRA. We recognize that because they were there this whole time, they are entitled to certain protections, especially with regard to maintaining their own cultural institutions. To answer uh, the second question, from experience, uh, it's a matter of accessibility. So there are laws in place protecting IP rights. So that's already a fact. But uh, a lot of cases where in violation of their rights arise, they don't really have the means to access legal assistance to defend their cause. In my experience, when I had my CLEP, uh, we dealt with a land dispute involving an IP community in Zambales. And they sought help from UP law because it accommodates their circumstances. So, but there's still a lot of hurdles. So... For example, the time wherein we were supposed to have a face-to-face interview with them, it was really, really hard. But they under- they, for them, it was like they understood that uh, this is an opportunity they really wanted to take to be able to uh, get their case settled. So they traveled from their province to UPBGC just to have a meeting with us. Like, imagine that kind of how hard it would be for them to do that, especially the weather was so bad. Tapos there's also a pandemic. It, they were just really lucky that at that time, there wasn't a, a lockdown that was imposed on their area because um, we had a different client. They weren't able to meet with us naman. Because in their area, there was a lockdown. They can't go out and nobody can get in. So we weren't able to 
have a face-to-face interview with them, unlike with our IT clients. Also, the issue of who they're up against. So usually it involves people who have more access to further their interests and they take advantage of the indigenous peoples. So like in this case, it's a big company and I'm, I'm just not going to name drop which one. But um, what happened was there was a family who asserted that um, they have a title to the land being occupied by the IPs, even though they have documentation that is part of their ancestral land. And the family that was saying that they have a title to it, they sold the land to that big company for uh, the creation of uh, a certain facility or establishment. And they were saying that uh, because that area is very ripe and very useful and it's the prime area to uh, take on this business endeavor. So by looking at that, there's this imbalance of um, power here that uh, people who are rich, companies, families who have more means like money or connection, really their rights are in a way more protected because they can actually uh, seek out legal assistance to defend themselves or even just from the get-go before there's even a case that would arise. They're already working with these connections. Like for us, we're, the problem was how did they even get this quote-unquote title to that land when it's already an ancestral land? So is it, do they have connections? Were they, did they pay up someone? Or was it more of a personal connection, a favor from somebody who can provide them with the title, etc.? So um so I guess that we can say that despite there being laws in favor of protecting IP rights uh there are not efforts to actually make sure these are followed without there having a problem muna. So another factor is that there is a discrimination against the communities the existing misconceptions that uh, make people more comfortable that ah it's easy to manipulate them e- it's easy to find loopholes it we can use this to our advantage. So like like in the case we handled, it's about indigenous lands. So Madalisha, Madalisha is manipulate for them. And so it's not they're not really protected because there is an imbalance of access to resources. For the first question, yes, indigenous peoples' rights are definitely human rights, and indigenous peoples are among those which are considered vulnerable groups because they experience a higher degree of socioeconomic marginalization, and they are less likely to have access to adequate health facilities and housing. So that is why they have all the rights contained in the International Bill of Rights, but they also have specific rights because of their unique position as, as Kyle said, the very first people to live in their nations. So in fact, in 2007, the United Nations adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And in that text, it states that the General Assembly affirms that Indigenous Peoples are equal to all other peoples, while recognizing that the rights of all peoples are different, and they consider themselves to be different, and we have to respect that. So indigenous rights stem from the human right that we all have uh, self-determination, that we have the ability to make the choices that we want in our lives in order to attain the kind of life that we want. And for the second question, um, IP rights aren't as adequately protected because, well, I think it's the lingering effects of colonialism. And uh, moreover, there isn't really a mechanism to check if their rights are being violated. And uh, when these rights are violated, there is hardly any repercussion. So there's the me- there's also that mentality that, for example, when you're taking away their land in order to make shopping malls, subdivisions, resorts, that we're doing it for progress. But I don't know if you saw this, but there was a documentary still, like a screenshot that was circulating on social media. Uh, it says that that's what we term as progress is, but for indigenous people, progress is also having enough air to breathe and enough food for everyone while not totally destroying uh, the nature in their lands. So thank you for all your answers. I think we have adequately sort of pinpointed where the problems lie, as well as some underlying reasons for why those problems exist, especially when we talk about IP rights. I guess now I want to ask what questions are, I mean, what recommendations you would have to alleviate the problem. So 
what do you think we can do? Maybe you as law students or us as just people who are aware of these problems. What can we do to help? So in my humble opinion, uh, and I'm not saying that this is the only uh, this is the only solution, but uh, I think for me, we f- should focus on what's important and essential. So while this is not the, the only solution, I think it's the most important. So what's important and essential is securing indigenous people's land. And if their land rights are not only recognized, but protected, then indigenous communities thrive. So while we have the law, such as um, the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act and the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples' Rights, so while those exist, there is a gap between policy and practice. So we have to bridge this gap. And the reason that um, some, and the reason that indigenous peoples are more likely to live below the poverty line is because they get driven out of their homes in their land. So in the Philippines, for example, the Lumad groups were displaced as a result of being forced out of their homes due to land grabbing and militarization. Their schools are bombed, they lose their livelihood, and the right to social security is violated for sure. So for indigenous people, their land is their identity and we deprive them of their identity when we take away their land. So moving forward, indigenous people should be included in the discussion when it comes to land use and not just with our government either, with private corporations too, as what um, AJ discussed in, in the case that she took on. Private corporations have to create this dialogue between um, indigenous people. They, we have to come together. Uh, and, and I know that might sound very idealistic, but that's what should happen. And at the same time, we must engage in public awareness that these things are happening. So, for example, the LUMAD groups, again, in the Philippines have become the target of red tagging for demanding for their rights. And often these issues are not brought to the forefront of national consciousness or simply ignored, which is alarming since these are people we should care about. They compromise 10 to 20 percent of the population of the Philippines and they protect our culture and our heritage. And at the same time, while I'm saying all of this, it's important that we shouldn't speak for indigenous peoples. Advancing their interests should mean that we actually consult them and create a dialogue to know what each specific indigenous group uh, thinks, what, what, what their interests are. And it's vital that we allow them to speak for themselves. I agree with Miss Nat, especially the part about um, uh, having a dialogue dialogue and a discourse with indigenous people communities. So to build on that, I think we need more advocates for our IP communities because um, it matters a lot for them to have someone to fight alongside them. So I agree with Miss Nat that it's not about speaking for them. It's better that we speak with them and fight alongside them. So we could be able to help bring awareness to their issues and problems on various platforms. Because based on my experience with our clients before, they don't really engage in like social media and everything. So how they reached out to us was that there was a representative from uh, an NGO who was helping them with their case. And that's how communication was um uh, affected between us. So there's this person who actually has access to uh, Zoom, to Facebook, everything like that. And she's going relay na information. So seeing as there's that kind of circumstance and they're very loyal to their traditions and the respect for their land really, uh, you know, involve um, living simply and without um, the influence of technology, to have people like us advocate for them would uh, widen the awareness and give more channels and opportunities for other people to also know about their, not just their problems, but also their cultures and traditions. For me, it was um, particularly heartwarming hearing from them firsthand, their stories and their passion for, for their traditions. Like for us in the legal profession, when we were handling their case, it was, okay, this is a land dispute. But when we interviewed them, it has a very rich culture behind it. Like the lands that they live on, it has been in their family for you know, many, many, many years as in before the war and everything. So when you hear it from them and if we're, they're given the platform and they're given the opportunity to talk about it to a greater audience through the works of people who advocate for them, I believe that more people 
would be inspired to make a change and prevent history from repeating itself and having the same problems pa ulit ulit happening to different communities and you know just doing the bare minimum of resolving disputes when we can just prevent it altogether yeah also one of the things that we can actually do in the coming months is to vote like study on candidates who are most likely to engage in those conversations with indigenous communities and vote them into office so that we can have more of these discussions in like the actual branches of our government. Yeah, I agree. I think everyone should vote if you're able to vote. That's one way we can help these groups as well as helping ourselves. There was something that struck me earlier because there was a discussion on the role of technology. And it made me remember that as much as we can trust technology, there are also some downsides to using it, as well as downsides to our reliance of it. Especially now, I guess, during the time of COVID, where we seem to be living our lives online and living our lives through a space that we might not know a lot about, right? So I guess this brings me now to the discussion of privacy and privacy as a human right specifically, because there are times where I've noticed, or at least from my understanding of things, authorities can ask you for information and you just have to sort of give it. Like, how does that work? How is that not a violation of your rights? How are people not harmed by this rule? Are there ways to protect yourself when it comes to these instances? Well, okay. So the first thing that you were saying was that since we live online, I I think that your concern was um, big companies stealing our data, you know? And that's a big privacy concern. You're right. Especially when you're in the metaverse, they're even getting information or data about our bodies, our body movements, and stuff like that. So that is a relationship between private persons. So you have something like Facebook or Google and us. So usually, the the traditional view of rights is that you don't really look to the actions of private persons and say it's a violation of human rights. So here in the Philippines, actually, even in my constitutional law two class. We were talking about how the Bill of Rights applies not between two private persons, but between you and the state. So technically, though, technically, a private person cannot violate your rights, your constitutional rights. But you still have to recognize that we are deprived a lot of these protections because of the actions of corporations. So there are a few things that you can do to deal with that. The first is make sure as the state, you know, the the state should make sure that whenever they're taking data from you, there should be consent. And number two, we should always ask our government to create those policies to ensure that our privacy is protected against private corporations. And by doing so, we make corporations liable for attacks on our own rights. But another thing, the second thing that you're asking is, how about authorities naman? Can government officials just ask you for information and you have to just give it? Um, that is actually a different, it's a different thing because um, it is the government now that's violating your right. So what we have in the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, is you have the right to be secure against unlawful or arbitrary invasions of privacy. So it can be limited. You do have a right to privacy, but it can be limited as long as there is a law allowing that limitation and if the law isn't unreasonable. So if they're going to ask you to give information, the first thing you need to think of, this is not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> but I suppose the first thing you want to check is, is it a lawful thing for them to ask? Um, is there a law that authorizes them to collect that information from you? But second, let's suppose that there is a law. Okay, there's a law. The next question is, is that a reasonable law, right? Is it arbitrary? So in order to do this, there is a test that is established by the Supreme Court and the white light case. They call it the white light case. But in that case, um, the right to privacy was considered a fundamental right, which means that in order for it to be restricted or limited by the government, in order for that restriction to be considered reasonable, not arbitrary, there needs to be a compelling state interest. And this is the least restrictive ways to get that compelling state interest. If there is an easier, less intrusive way to get that interest, that is what we should be 
forwarding. So those are just the questions that you want to ask when you're talking about privacy. So just to expound a bit on what Kyle said, so there are two kinds of privacy. So the decisional privacy, which involves the right to uh, independence in making important decisions. And for the this specific context, what we should focus on is informational privacy, which refers to the interest in avoiding disclosure of personal matters. So under this kind, there are two aspects. The first one is the right to not, not to have private information disclosed. And the, and the second one is the right to live freely without surveillance and intrusion. So the right, there is the right of an individual to control information about oneself. Uh, on the other hand, on the hand of the state, there is the state police power. So this is the power to restrain and regulate uh, the use of liberty and property uh, to promote public welfare. But the exercise of this is not supposed to be indiscriminate. So there is a test. So the first one is um, it must appear that the interest of the general public, as, dit- as distinguished from those of a particular class, require such interference. And then the second one is that they're, they're, the means uh, employed is reasonable and necessary for the accomplishment of the purpose and not unduly oppressive upon individuals. So as Kyle said, um, it's important to have consent to note that there should be consent in the sharing and the dissemination or the collection of um, private information. So I think it, this is a good reminder for us to read um, terms and conditions when we're uh, signing up for something or even when we're signing contracts or anything like that. We should be able to uh, read and be appraised of everything that will be done to the data which we are sharing to, um, which is accessible to the government or to the public in general. I, I think that's, that's uh, a healthy uh, way to approach uh, and protect uh, one's privacy. So in relation to this, so there is the Data Privacy Act of 2012, which requires personal information controllers and personal information processors to implement reasonable and appropriate security measures uh, for the protection of personal data. Uh, I think everyone has encountered um, uh, there are this like um, disclaimers or something that says that um, the data which you will be using for uh, which you will be sharing to us for this. Um, certain uh, form or thing like when we're signing um, when we're entering establishments here during the pandemic where we write our name and everything that it's going to be used for a certain specific purpose which is for contact tracing or for contacting us in, se- uh, in cases of uh, emergency or something like that so it's important that there's um, that we are being told what our data is going to be used for and it's also our responsibility as users of this uh, various um, means like um, the internet um, and, you know, just availing of entering establishments during the pandemic, that we know what we're up against and that uh, we're consenting to it. So I think that's uh, that's an important factor to consider uh, in this question. So thank you so much. I guess right now our discussions have been mostly, well, I wouldn't say they're all international, but they seem to not be very localized. So I kind of want to talk about that now. I want to go and look at the situation in the Philippines, what's happening here, whether our laws are working, whether we're upholding human rights. There was already a mention of this, but I kind of want to clarify, and this goes for our audience as well. What does the CHR do? What is it? Why are they there? What powers do they have? And as Filipinos, what do we need to know about this kind of institution? So the CHR, or the Commission on Human Rights, it's an independent constitutional body. And what that means is it's independent, meaning it functions separately from the other branches of government, meaning it's not under the executive, legislative, or judicial. It's its own thing. And it's constitutional because it was created by the 1987 constitution and subsequently established by executive order number 163. So it was included in our present constitution because of the many atrocities of the martial law era. And the drafters of our constitution were like, we don't want those things to happen anymore. And when they do, we want at least accountability. So the most important work that the CHR does is they investigate human rights violations in the Philippines. However, they cannot adjudicate cases, but they can forward them to the proper authorities for proper action. 
So for example, in 2012, what the CHR did was they recommended to the office of the Ombudsman that they look into the office of the mayor of Davao, which was then President Duterte. So for they said, uh, they told the Ombudsman, take a look at what's happening in Davao because there may be possible administrative and criminal actions, uh, criminal uh, liabilities rather. However, that case was eventually terminated because there was lack of evidence. They also work with uh, non-governmental organizations or NGOs to push for a more just and humane society. So, for example, in 2017, the Human Rights Watch reported that there was an investigation done by the CHR of the secret jails that were placed in police stations, which were which were imprisoning mostly those arrested on drug charges. So, yeah, uh, the Human Rights Watch uh, published an article on this so that the international community uh, is alerted that these things are happening in the Philippines. Uh, what the CHR does, they also monitor whether the Philippine government is being compliant with the UDHR and the other treaties that we've signed. Uh, uh, and bringing this back to how we how we measure whether the international obligations that we've signed are uh, that we're that we're being compliant to. You mentioned something that sort of took me aback a bit because based on your description of the CHR, they don't seem to do a lot in terms of adjudicating adjudicating cases, right? You said that they oversee, they make recommendations. What is really stopping us from giving them more powers besides you know, forwarding cases to proper authorities and investigating certain issues, because wouldn't it be difficult to achieve change if they are investigating the same bodies that have power over them? For example, as you mentioned, the Duterte case or the fact that there are investigations right now when uh, Duterte was the mayor of Davao, but it was terminated because of lack of evidence. A lot of people say, and a lot of theories exist, that, you know, there might have been evidence, but they were just hushed or silenced because of the fact that power play took place. Well, it's it's hard to speculate on what happened with that particular case. Okay, Although I think it, it's pretty strong evidence that, you know, Duterte, Rodrigo Duterte declared then that he had some people killed. Like that seems like a declaration against his own interest. Um, But honestly, if the question is what's stopping us from giving the Commission of Human Rights more power, honestly, I don't think that there are because these powers are found in the Constitution. Uh, So they are limited in the Constitution, but it doesn't mean that you can't expand them. The reason why they're in the Constitution as they are is it's basically the framer saying that I know it's not a lot right now, but this is the bare minimum that they should have. You can increase its coverage. Right now, it only covers civil and political rights. It does not actually cover economic, social, and cultural rights. But you can expand it to those to those rights as well. Um, it only has those powers that not mentioned. But Congress can expand its jurisdiction and expand its powers. That's actually what they did with the Ombudsman. Uh, the Ombudsman has powers under the Constitution. But Congress passed laws that greatly expanded the powers of the Ombudsman to the point that actually um, the Ombudsman is one of the most Uh, The Philippine Ombudsman is one of the most powerful ombudsmen in the world, Um, just in terms of the powers that it has. So there's nothing theoretically stopping us from making the Congress give them more powers. We just need to ask for it. There might be some questions here, like there might be some overlapping jurisdictions and stuff. There might be some more technical things that we have to figure out. But theoretically, there's nothing really stopping us theoretically from giving them more powers. I guess that's a little bit more optimistic, right? Like there seems to be limitations, but there are also, there is also the possibility of expanding those roles and making things easier in the long run. I guess if we are going to take that route and start now being a little bit more optimistic, because I did notice we have been rather pessimistic about human rights this past few hours. Um, I want to ask about what it means to be a lawyer in the Philippines. Because it seems inspiring to me that a lot of small-scale lawyers opt to become human rights advocates, despite the job being pro bono. So I kind of want to ask, what do you think inspires that? Why do you think that takes place? What are your thoughts on it? Well, first of all, um, there there's a lot of appeal to you know fighting the good fight because uh, hopefully, if you if you're in law school, hopefully you're educated not just on what the law says, 
but also the weaknesses in that law, which is why uh, a lot of law schools right now, they're also adding stuff about uh, legal history, legal philosophy, and stuff like that, so that you can assess not just what the law is, but why the law is the way that it is, what it actually says, who is it really protecting. So um, uh, in order to like understand yung limitations natin as lawyers or as law students, we need to understand that even though all laws are being applied equally, they are not um, targeted towards the same people equally. So if there is a law that um, prohibits you from begging, like for, for a very long period of time, it was being enforced that you cannot beg, you can't ask for alms on the street. Um, I think it was in the anti mendicancy law. Um, obviously, you can say, Duralex said Lex, right? Duralex said Lex. We would apply that even if a rich person was begging. But obviously, it's anti-poor because sure, you can apply it against a rich person, but a rich person would never resort to begging because they're so uh, better off. So on a principled level, I, I mean, I like to believe that lawyers are trained to think about these uh, things and care about them very deeply. But secondly, it's just something that we have to do. Um, it's actually in the Code of Professional Responsibility, which is basically the Book of Legal Ethics. It's our um, it's our Hippocratic Oath or something like that. Um, under the Code of Professional Responsibility, lawyers can't reject the cause of the oppressed, of the de- of the defenseless, and of the poor, except for valid reasons like you don't think you can carry out the work competently, uh, like in the case of a very complicated field of law or very complicated case, or Uh, a valid reason like conflict of interest. I am actually representing another party to your case. Uh, So in a sense, lawyers have a duty to be human rights advocates if um, human rights victims come to them in their hour of need or something. Um, You also can't discriminate on the basis of race, sex, religion, social status, or even on the basis of whether you think they're guilty. So there are some times that you go like, why are you defending this person who's so obviously guilty? Um, the reason for that is even people who have done things that are bad, they still deserve a good defense from their lawyers. Uh, that's part of due process. Lawyers have a duty to support legal reform uh, and help improve the system. If I'm mistaken, that's Canon 4 and 5 of the Code of Professional Responsibility. So many lawyers decide to embody those principles because it's the ethical thing to do. Uh, and as much as possible, they want to do it, even if it's pro bono, even if they... Um, won't get a lot of money for it. Because honestly, um, people really think that most lawyers, they are in it for the money, but they actually just want to help people as well. Um, so there was a questioning before K, uh, Miriam Defensor Santiago against uh, a lawyer. Sabi niya, why would you abandon a very lucrative position in a big law firm in order to be in the position where you are now? Um, and the implication there was there must be something wrong with you. You must be doing something corrupt because you're making less money now. But for that person, the real reason why they moved is because they felt like they can make a better difference in that new place. So, I mean, lawyers, even if they're small scale lawyers, they do it because they genuinely believe in the work that they're doing. Um, I think aside from uh, professional responsibility, it's also about advocacy and personal experience for some. Like there are lawyers who actually come from backgrounds which uh, expose them to the harsh realities that they want remedied. Like they experience um, not being able to have uh, legal assistance when their family needed it. Or, you know, they have family members who experience the same. So they were living in poverty. And that they acknowledge that uh, it's up to them to effect change for people who have the same background like theirs. Uh, there are lawyers also who while they themselves have not experienced the hardships, they see the injustices around them and would like to use their privilege to help. So that's why I think um, Ola and Klep uh, is so important and it's so much more than just practical and exposure to the rea- uh, realities of the legal profession. Like, oh, dummy paperwork, oh, applying my CIVPRO, my REMLO, everything like that. It also provides um, opportunity for awareness that legal assistance is really inaccessible for some until we make it available for them. Because for a lot of the clients, a lot of people in general, money is really an issue, uh, especially when seeking uh, counsel or other forms of uh, legal assistance. So based on experience, I remember this one time that there was this elderly woman. She approached me in Malcolm. She was asking me for um, directions to the, all the office. 
And then she also asked me to help her uh, sort her uh, the paper she was bringing. So she had her affidavit and everything that she was asking me uh, for help. Saan siya pipirma? What she supposed to write? Um, uh, ano ba yung, uh, like, is she supposed to like uh, fix the documents in order or something like that before she hands it over? So it was, uh, I saw that she was really uh, eager and determined to get her case settled. And Ola gave her the opportunity to do that. And for some people, buti siya, she was aware that there's an opportunity for help. For some people, they're not even aware of that. Na, um, there are free legal assistance groups here that can help me. So um, when lawyers choose to do uh, pro bono work, It's just widening that circle that provides uh, not just assistance but also provides um shows compassion for our less fortunate brothers and sisters who really need our help but don't really have the means to avail of it considering their circumstances. I think what it boils down to at the end of the day that lawyering is pretty much a calling if, even if that sounds cheesy. I don't think any of us or even the three of us, we went into UP law with um, years and years of crying and blood, sweat and tears. Uh, just, you know, do it for the money because you can do other things that will get you more money. Lawyering isn't necessarily going to make you rich and famous. Um, you can do other things. You can go into easier jobs, like, you know, get into easier jobs and get more money. But Uh, law school and lawyering is a is a calling and um, it really the work the legal work even in uh, pro bono work um, there are some things money can't buy I guess um, I worked with the humanitarian legal assistance foundation last mid-year and the work involves um, working with people deprived of liberty and you know just Seeing that you changed people's lives, these aren't things that you can get just with just with any um, career that you only want money from. Uh, and in connection with what Kyle said with the code of professional responsibility and in connection with what I just said, um, I think that that provision is in there because lawyers have a huge responsibility to society. Can you imagine basically having someone's life in your hands, like having their whole lives changed of what you're doing. Lawyers have a direct function in the legal system. And when one takes on advocacy lawyering, they aren't just advocating for that one case. That case opens up doors that weren't there before. So it, it really is like taking on Goliath. For example, if you're taking on a case for fishermen in the West Philippine Sea, you're not just changing the lives of these 10, 15 fishermen, you're changing the whole scope of what's happening with all the fishermen that uh, fish in the West Philippine Sea. So yeah, when when it's difficult, But when you're successful, you help out so many people. I guess the last question now to end this episode would be to those who want to learn more about this, um, not just about human rights in general, but perhaps law and everything else that deals with it. Is there a book or a blog or a series or movie, etc., that you would like to recommend to anyone who might want to know more about human rights law in theory? So maybe something that's basic, Uh, maybe something that will allow people to, you know, enter this world without being overwhelmed initially. I'm not gonna lie, most of the the human rights readings are definitely uh, headache-inducing, some of them. Um, but I think what it comes down to is an appreciation of human rights theory and practice. So for philosophical foundations of human rights, what we talked about uh, in the very first part, Um, I would recommend The Good Place, the TV series. It's on Netflix. So the show talks about mostly utilitarianism, uh, the teachings of Immanuel Kant and David Hume. And in the end, what the show boils down to, and not for, uh, not making any spoilers here, uh, is what makes us human is that we have obligations to each other to treat each other with respect and dignity. And to take uh, some terminology from the show, we should try not to be an asshole to each other. Because even when we say we don't need anybody else, then 
that we actually do need other people. So in that show, uh, one of the characters, Chidi Anagonye, he's a Kantian. So he believes that there is always a should to all our actions. So when he makes a choice, he thinks about, is this the kind of society I want to live in? But the show just gives you a peek at what the concepts of human rights come from. So for example, uh, with regard to utilitarianism, they illustrate the concept with the trolley problem. You know, uh, that when you're on a train track, you're on a trolley and there's two uh, splitting tracks and uh, you can either switch the, the switch the, switch the little um, mechanism thing and you can either kill five people or kill one person. So that's an illustration of utilitarianism. Um, if you want to talk about how human rights um, in other countries, the issues of human rights in other countries to appreciate why we need a, uh, a to appreciate why there's a UDHR, um, we can go to, you can try and read um, I Am Malala, which is a book by Malala Yousafzai. Uh, it basically narrates her life, uh, how she wasn't, uh, how she was prevented from going to school. And because she protested that, she was, you know, shot in the head. And uh, basically, uh, she survived, but she's uh, advocating for the right of young girls everywhere to uh, do the right to education. And if you're if you want to go beyond appreciation and you want to learn more about the UN treaties and the charters, the UN website, the United Nations website, it has tons of primers with uh, great layouts and uh, formatting that, you know, it's a joy to read. Basically, it has tons of primers on human rights practice. And if you're more of if you want to, if you're more of a visual learner and you want to see um, a like mini docu series, there is Explain on Netflix. It's pretty good in breaking down difficult topics into bite-sized, 18 to 20-minute mini documentaries. They talk about gender disparity in living wages, the racial wealth gap, and why minorities are more vulnerable to social economic discrimination, and. Uh, for advocacy lawyering that we talked about just a while ago, you can read or you can watch To Kill a Mockingbird, the book or the film. They're both good. They're both great. Um, and Philadelphia, the film uh, for advocacy lawyering. And lastly, I recommend, of course, you watch The Kingmaker so that you understand why we put certain provisions in the 1987 constitution so that the things that happened during the Marcus regime doesn't happen again. Hopefully, fingers crossed that, you know, things like that don't happen again. And yeah. Yeah. So reiterating you to kill a mockingbird, I know 100% that you at some point um, you were told that you have to read To Kill a Mockingbird for like a high school English class or something. And you were like, yeah, OK, I'll do it. But you actually just spark notes it. No, this time just actually read it <laughs> because that's an important thing that you need to read. Um, I think for movies, perhaps rewatch Les Mis because Les Mis is, um, is really useful in sort of illustrating that the law can be applied unjustly if it is not consistent with a human rights-based approach. Um, I'd also want to reiterate the importance of the UN website, like the, the fact sheets that are um, published by the UN. So you can Google it right now, actually. I, I'm serious, like Google it right now. Type in human rights fact sheets. And the first link is a link to the United Nations um, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, it gives you like a lot of fact sheets. Um, and as Nat said, they're they're super gorgeous. Um, so one of it is about enforcer involuntary appearances. Um, some other ones are even about how to file a complaint. Uh, it's an individual complaint procedure under the United Nations Human Rights Treaties, um, Indigenous Peoples and the United Nations Human Rights System, et cetera, et cetera. It's a wonderful resource for you to have. Um, and the best part is you might be scared because that, you know, it's it's too complicated. Thankfully, those fact sheets are very accessible. Like even if you're not an expert, if you're an average reasonable person, or even if you're just, you know, interested, you can check them out. And it, it's made in a very accessible manner with a very accessible language. It's great to check out. 
All right. So thank you so much to the three of you for sharing all your insights. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience has learned a lot as well about human rights, the issues that come with it, as well as your recommendations based on your learnings from class. So thank you so much again for appearing on our podcast. We appreciate all the information you've shared with us. And I personally wish you luck with the rest of your classes and the rest of your law school experience. Uh, So that's it. For this episode of Debatable, we'll see you in the next one, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Thank you.